a peculiar occurrence fan? Well, I've opened up a store just for you. So head on over and buy your peculiar occurrence gear today. Links are in the description box below. Thank you. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1945, a fire destroyed the Sauter home in West Virginia. At the time, it was occupied by George Sauter, his wife Jenny, and nine of their ten children. During the fire, George, Jenny, and four of the nine children escaped with their lives. The bodies of the other five children have never been found. The Sauters believe for the rest of their lives that the five missing children survived. So have you heard of the Sauter family? This certainly is a peculiar case. So let's get into it. Welcome to Peculiar Occurrences. I am your host, Lilith Nova. George Sauter was born in Italy in 1895. He immigrated to the United States at 13 years old with his older brother, who went back home as soon as him and George had cleared customs at Ellis Island. For the rest of his life, George Sauter would not speak much of why he left his homeland. Sauter eventually found work on the railroads in Pennsylvania, carrying water and other supplies to workers. After a few years, he took more permanent work in Smithers, West Virginia, as a driver. After a few more years, he started his own trucking company. At first hauling fill dirt to construction sites, and then later hauling coal that was mined in the region. Jenny Capareri, a storekeep's daughter, who had also immigrated here to America from Italy during her childhood, soon became his wife. The couple settled in an area that had a large number of Italian immigrants and a two-story wooden house. In 1923, they had the first of their ten children. George's business quickly grew, and they became one of the most respected middle-class families around. In the words of one local official, however, he had strong opinions about many subjects and was not shy about expressing them, sometimes even alienating people. In particularly, his opinions on Mussolini had led to some strong arguments with other immigrants. The Sauter's youngest child, Sylvia, was born in 1943. By then, their oldest had went to go serve in World War II. The following year, Mussolini was executed. Yet George's criticism of the late dictator had left some with hard feelings. In October 1945, a visiting life insurance salesman warned George that his house would go up to flames and his children would be destroyed due to his thoughts and his words on Mussolini. Another man who had showed up looking for work went around to the back and warned George that his house would go up in flames one day due to the breaker box. He found that strange since they had just gotten an electrical stove and had the entire house rewired and the electric company had inspected the home and said everything was fine. In the days leading up to Christmas, his sons also noticed a peculiar car parked across the way from them, seemingly watching the Sauter children as they returned home from school. Christmas Eve, 1945. Marion, the oldest daughter, had been working at a dime store downtown, and she surprised three of her youngest sisters. Martha, age 12. Jenny, age 8. Betty, age 5. With new toys she had bought for them as gifts. The young children were so excited that they asked their mother if they could stay up past their usual bedtime. At 10 o'clock, Jenny told them that they could stay up a little longer as long as their brothers that were still awake, 14-year-old Maurice and 9-year-old Louis, remembered to put the cows up for the evening and feed the chickens before going to bed. Her husband and the two oldest boys, John, age 23, and George Jr., age 16, who had spent the day working for their father, were already asleep. 
After reminding the children of those two remaining chores, she took baby Sylvia, age two, upstairs and went to bed. The telephone rang at 12.30 a.m. Jenny awoke and went downstairs to answer it. It was a woman whose voice she did not recognize. Asking for a name she was not familiar with. With the sounds of laughter and clicking glasses in the background. She told the caller she had reached a wrong number, later recalling the woman's weird laugh. She hung up and returned to bed. As she did, she noticed that the lights were still on and the curtains were not drawn, something the children usually took care of if they stayed up later than the parents. So Jenny assumed that the children that had stayed up later had went back up to the attic and went to sleep. She closed the curtains, turned off the lights, and returned to bed. At 1 o'clock a.m., Jenny was again awoken by the sound of something hitting the roof, with a loud bang and then a rolling noise. After hearing nothing further, she went back to sleep. After another half hour, she woke up again. When she got up again, she found that the room that George used as his office was in flames, mostly around the telephone line and the fuse box. She woke George and in turn, he woke the older sons, both parents and four of their children. Marion, Sylvia, John, and George Jr. escaped the house. They frantically yelled to the children upstairs, but heard no response. They could not go up there because the stairway itself was already aflame. John Sauter said in his first initial interview that he had went upstairs to alert his siblings. Though he later changed his story to he hadn't gone up there but only called up there because the steps were on fire. Efforts to find aid and save the children were unexpectedly complicated. The phone did not work. So Marion ran to the neighbors to call the fire department. A driver on the road also seen the flames and called from a nearby tavern. They were unsuccessful either because the operator would not answer or phones turned out to be broken. Eventually, someone reached the fire department from a phone in the center of town. George Barefoot climbed the wall and broke open an attic window, cutting his arm in the process. He and his sons intended on using a ladder to try to get to them, but it was not in its usual resting place up against the house. A water barrel that could have been used to put out the fire was frozen solid. George then tried to pull both of his trucks up to the house to climb on them to get up to the window and neither one would start, despite having worked the day before. Frustrated, the six solders who had survived had no choice but to desperately sit by and watch the house burn to ash over the next 45 minutes. They assumed the other five children had perished in the blaze. Due to the war and volunteer firefighters, the fire department could not respond for seven hours. Chief F.J. Morris said the next day that the already slow response was hindered even slower due to having to wait for someone that had the capability to drive the fire truck, since he did not. The firefighters, one of whom was Jenny's brother, could do little more but look through the ashes that were left in the solder's basement. They found absolutely nothing of the children. The Sauters never rebuilt the house. Nevertheless, Morris believed that the five children had in fact died in the fire, and that the fire was hot enough to completely burn the bodies. Chief told George Sauter to leave the site alone so that the marshal's office could conduct a more thorough investigation. But after four days, they couldn't take it anymore, and George covered the site over under five feet of dirt to turn it into a memorial garden for his children. The local coroner convened an inquest the next day, which held that the fire was an accident caused by faulty wiring. But later, a private investigator that the Sauters had hired found that one of the jurors that deemed this an accident just happened to be the insurance salesman that had threatened them previously over Mussolini. Family questions about the official account. Not long after 
the Sauters started to rebuild their lives, they started to question the official story. They wondered why, if it had been caused by an electrical problem, why did the family's Christmas lights remain on so long, when the power should have immediately gone out. Then they found their missing ladder that was always up against the house, down the side of an embankment, nearly 75 feet away. Their telephone repairman told the Sauters that their telephone line had not been burned through, but actually cut. Jenny Sauter also had trouble believing Fireman Morrison's account that the bodies had been completely burned in the fire, since a lot of the household appliances had been found still intact. A local coroner had told Jenny that bodies remain even after being burned at 2000 Fahrenheit for two hours, which is a lot hotter and a lot longer than the house had burned. George Sauter also believed his trucks had been tampered with, which is why they wouldn't start, though his sons believed that they may have flooded the engines in their haste to start the vehicles. Jenny Sauter tended to the memorial garden for the rest of her life, but further developments in 1946 reinforced the family's belief that the children they may be memorializing may still be alive. First, there was evidence to support the fact that their house had not been set ablaze in an electrical fire, but had been set on fire on purpose. When a bus driver who had been passing through on Christmas Eve said that he had spotted people throwing balls of fire at the house. And then after the winter snow had cleared, Jenny had found a pineapple bomb looking ball in the brushes. Other witnesses had claimed to had seen the children themselves. One witness who had been watching the fire from the roadside claimed to have seen the children passing by in a car as the house burned to the ground. Another woman at a road stop said that she had served them breakfast the next morning and noted the presence of a car with Florida license. The Sauters hired an investigator named C.C. Tinsley to look into the case. He is the one that had learned that the insurance salesman had been on the jurors. As well, he also found out that Morris had confessed to a priest that he had actually found a heart at the site and didn't want to give it to them. So he packed it in a box and later buried it. When George Sauter found this out, he immediately went to Mr. Morris demanding to know what he had found. He agreed to show the two where he had buried it and dug it up. Mr. Sauter took what Morris had given him to a funeral home to have it examined. The coroner found that what he had been given was nothing other than very fresh beef liver. Morris later admitted that the box with liver did not come from the fire that he had actually put that in place to try to convince the Sauters that the children had died in a fire and put their minds at rest. George Sauter did not wait for reports of sightings to come in. Sometimes he went after them himself. After seeing pictures of a New York dancer who looked a lot like his daughter Betty, he drove all the way there and visited her school demanding to see her and was refused. He also tried to convince the FBI to investigate what he considered a kidnapping. Director J. Edgar Hoover personally responded to his letters. Although I would like to be of service, he wrote. The matters related seem to be of, of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of this bureau. If the local authorities requested their help, he added, he would of course direct agents to assist but the police and the fire department both declined to do so. In August 1949, George was able to persuade Oscar Hunter, a Washington DC pathologist, to supervise a new search through the dirt at the house site. After a very long search, a few artifacts including a dictionary and a few coins that once belonged to one of the children were found. Several small bones were also uncovered, determined to be human vertebrae. They were sent to Marshall T. Newman, 
a specialist at the Smithsonian Institution. They were confirmed to be lumbar vertebrae, all from the same person. Someone between 16 and 17 years old, though the oldest child to die was a 14-year-old. Newman added that the bone showed no sign of exposure to flame. Newman also said that this whole thing was very strange since a wood fire should have left full skeletons. The report concluded that the vertebrae more than likely came from the dirt that Sauter had actually moved over the site. The investigation and its findings attracted national attention. In the West Virginia, legislator held two hearings on the case in 1950. Afterwards though, the Sauters were told their case was hopeless and the case was finally closed at the state level. The FBI decided they had justification as a possible interstate kidnapping, but dropped the case after two years of following fruitless leads. With the end of the official efforts to solve the case, the Sauters did not give up hope. They had flyers printed up with pictures of the children offering $5,000 reward, which soon doubled, for information that would settle the case for even one of the missing children. In 1952, they put up a billboard at the side of the house, another along US Route 60. With the same information, it would in time become a landmark for motorists. Their efforts soon brought another reported sighting of the children. George spent the rest of his life following up lead after lead after lead, traveling all over the country to where each and every tip had came from, fruitlessly following these leads. In 1967, George Sauter went to the Houston area. A woman there had written them a letter saying that Louise Sauter had revealed his true identity to her after one night of having too many drinks. She believed that him and Maurice were both living in Texas somewhere. But Sauter and his son-in-law, Grover Paxter, was unable to speak with her. The police were able to help them find the missing men that she had indicated, but both denied being his missing sons. Paxton said years later uh, that doubts about that denial lingered in Sauter's mind for the rest of his life. Another letter received in 1967 brought the Sauters what they believed was the most credible evidence that at least Luis was still alive. One day, Jenny found in the mail a letter postmarked to her. Inside was a picture of a young man around 30, with features strongly resembling Luis, who would have been in his 30s if he had survived. On the back was written, Luis Sauter, I love brother Frankie, little boys. A90132 or 35. They weren't sure if the 32 or 35. They hired another private investigator to go to Central City and look into this matter. But he never reported back to the Sauters and they were unable to find him afterwards. The picture nonetheless gave them hope. They kept the picture but actually left that lead alone out of fear that Luis would be harmed by the Sicily mob. They put an enlargement of the picture over their fireplace. George died in 1969. Jenny and her remaining children, except for the Otis John, who would never speak at the fire except to say that the family should move on with their lives, continued their search all the way up until Jenny's death in 1989. The surviving Sauter children, along with their grandchildren, continue to publicize this story through social media, still looking for the answers to what happened to their missing relatives. <sighs> that was a lot. Um, so have you ever heard of the Sauter family and all the peculiar occurrences surrounding this case? Let me know down in the comments below. As well, while you're down there, pick up one of our peculiar occurrences shirt or our peculiar squad shirts. Or look at the Novaland store and see if there's anything over there that you like. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you like this show, please subscribe. Hit that little bell button so you know when I upload every Friday. 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Be here. You know you wanna. And until next time, 
Keep your eyes peeled for all things peculiar. Do 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 Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah.